This episode is brought to you by Death on the Nile, exclusively in theaters Friday. The greatest detective of all time, Hercule Poirot, returns to solve another deadly case. Join Poirot on a wild ride down the Nile River, promising luxury, intrigue, and murder. Grab your friends and get ready to solve this murder mystery on the big screen. Starring Kenneth Branagh and Gal Gadot. Premiering only in theaters Friday. Something quite as simple that turns you into a laughing stock around the world. You have the World Cup and you lose it? It says, do not inform press or police. It would be a great pity to destroy this cup, but if you're willing to pay me £15,000... This is Stealing Victory. The untold story of the 1966 World Cup heist. Episode 2. One for the pot. In episode one, we heard how appalling security failings led to the World Cup trophy being stolen. Although the cup would be retrieved in time for England's victory that July, more than 50 years later, the crime remained unsolved and the identity of the thief was still unknown. I am Tom Pettifor, crime editor at the Daily Mirror newspaper in London. In 2017, in a throwaway comment, a trusted underworld source of mine told me that he knew the mystery burglar was a villain from South East London. The name he gave me was Sydney Q. I'm down in the bustling East Street Market off the Woolworth Road, where my source claimed Sydney had lived. As soon as I got the name, I used all of the databases available to me to try to trace potential matches. It threw up a Sydney Q, spelt K E W, born in 1936. But that was in Paddington on the other side of London. Searches at the British newspaper library using various spellings of the name also drew a blank. So I came here to talk to market stall holders and old-timer locals to see if they remembered Sydney or his brother Freddie. You never heard of him? Oh, no. Locals here? Yeah, yeah, brother called Freddie, Sydney and Freddie Coo. It doesn't mean anything. No, Sydney, Sydney and Freddie Coo. No, not ringing any bells. I haven't got a clue. All right, well, no. thanks very much. Anyway. No, it's all right. Where did he live? He lived around here? Yeah. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Sorry, sorry. I got nothing. Because you could sell anything those days. Well, not quite nothing. Well, nobody knew Sydney personally. This old market trader was around in the 60s and 70s. He gave me a feel for what the market was like back then, with all sorts of characters flogging all sorts of gear. Anything, and there were some characters the most scheming, cunning. I bought a pair of nylon stockings for my mum in 1955 for her birthday. I was about seven. I managed to save up about two shillings, which was maybe 20 pence a day. Right. In the morning, I'm sitting there smiling. How were they, Mum? She said they were very nice, but there was no feet in them. <laughs> the police were either in. It was so packed on a Sunday, you couldn't get in. Couldn't get in. They, they, it, it would open at five in the morning. You had all these dealers from Chelsea come down looking for, what do you think? Brands, even then, Harris Tweed jackets. Really? There were some amazing characters here. That was a social way of life, you know. You got it, they want it. What about, um, was there any sort of stolen, like, because this character was a bit more um, on the fringes sort of thing. Like, of oh, there was all sorts, all sorts. It wasn't mentioned, I mean, um, no. it's like, whenever a policeman pulls someone up around here, they say, they say, where'd you get that from? I got it from in the pub. Good background, but I was still no closer to finding out if Sydney Q was a real person. My source had said the brothers were well known during the 1960s in criminal circles. He claimed Sydney had dealings with some of the elderly burglars convicted of the infamous 2015 Hatton Garden heist. He also supposedly knew the great train robbers. With those sorts of connections, I hope some of my older crime reporter colleagues might have heard of him, but again, nothing. I was starting to question whether my source had got it wrong, but I didn't think so. I'd known him for years and his information was normally spot on. So I wouldn't be giving up just yet. Instead, I began digging deeper into what was already known. I started with the only book on the subject, The Theft of the Jules Rimet Trophy, The Hidden History of the 1966 World Cup by Martin Atherton. In a nutshell, if they put it in a film, nobody would watch it. Because <laughs> it was so unbelievable. It was just ridiculous. That's Martin. He's a die-hard Preston North End supporter. 
and the club's honorary historical statistician. You'll recall that the trophy had been stolen from a guarded hall just around the corner from Scotland Yard. After comparing the theft of the World Cup to a little shoplifting act, Cecil Richardson, head of the company hosting the exhibition, was asked about international reaction to the theft. Very harsh, of course. They were speaking, of course, from a considerable distance and with a minimum of facts. And I think that when eventually they do know the full details and the fact that we, we had the thing under adequate security, and then perhaps they'll temper their remarks. A furious Brazilian football official said the theft was a sacrilege that would never have been committed in his country, where even the thieves love football too much to do such a thing. The president of the Finnish FA was more blunt, saying, I'm damned angry. The World Cup was missing and the world was understandably furious. The pressure was on Scotland Yard to get the trophy back, and fast. So the job was handed to the elite flying squad. Detective Inspector Charles Leonard Buggy was put in charge. He was a no-nonsense detective who got results. Short, stocky, balding and 50 years of age, Buggy was certainly streetwise. He was also well connected to London's criminal fraternity. Much of the flying squad's success was down to its use of informants. The unit was known as the Heavy Mob, or the Sweeney, Cockney rhyming slang from Sweeney Todd, Flying Squad. In 1966, it was still headed by the legendary thief-taker Tommy Butler. Butler was famous by then for hunting down the great train robbers three years earlier. But despite the Flying Squad's reputation for getting results, this investigation didn't start well. A couple of people gave descriptions of people they'd seen lurking. Martin Atherton again. A couple of ladies came out to go to the ladies' toilets and there was a phone out next door to a public telephone. And one of them saw a man there and then somebody else gave a description of a different man. So immediately on the Sunday afternoon, the police put out a description of the thief. But they've got two descriptions, which are sufficiently different to suggest there were two people. So this was a right at the start. This is, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you know... Yeah. So they've got, OK, one said he's five foot eight, the other said he's five foot ten, so they settled on five foot nine. One was slim build, one was big build, so they put out his medium build. One of the descriptions mentioned the scarf, and again, this is in the police records, the actual witness statement is there. So when they put out the statement, they said he had a scar on his face. So well, that's a typing error. Who knows? So they're looking for a person who doesn't exist. So the investigation got off to a bad start. To get a better idea of the complexities and challenges facing DI Buggy, I spoke to former Flying Squad detective Peter Kirkham. Peter spent years working on high-profile cases, including complex robbery, drugs and murder investigations. So what does he make of these apparent blunders? Yeah, if you were sure that the descriptions were of different people, you obviously wouldn't conflate them. You'd say there could have been two people and, and put your two descriptions together. Yeah. But bear in mind, this all took place at incredible speed. Yeah. The description was put out, you know, within 24 hours, I think. Yeah, it would have been 24, 48 yeah, hours. Yeah. yeah. So it's very early days. I'm not even sure they'd got the taxi description by then. Right. So they were just doing the best they could with what they had. Mm. There's only three ways you ever solve a crime. Go on. Witnesses, yeah. admissions, and forensic. There was no forensics. Bear in mind, DNA didn't exist. They did have fingerprints, didn't Fingerprints, they? yeah, that, but they were, you know, way down the scale of complexity and sophistication compared to now. There was nothing, certainly not in the first 24, 48 hours. Mm. There was no admissions, because they hadn't got a suspect yet. So that only left witnesses. So in those days, and I'm not sure how we used to solve things before DNA and CCTV and mobile phones, to be honest, yeah. uh, but we did. And, and that was find as many witnesses as you can and get those descriptions and push them out there in the hope that something hits home. You know, you never see them these days, but we used to put forfeits out. You look at them now and, and they're just laughable, but you'd get results sometimes from them. And so... That's what they would be doing, and mm. getting those as quickly as possible and pushing them out there as best they can. And it was not at all unusual for an early description to go out on something serious, and this was serious as a detective chief inspector running the show for heaven's sake, and then it rarely came out of the pub, let alone their office. 
this was a serious matter. So they were pushing everything they got, throwing everything they got, and they knew their only hope was someone recognised these descriptions because they weren't going to find any CCTV. They weren't going to find any mobile phone stuff. They weren't going to find any AMPR on, on, on vehicles. They weren't going to find anything. Um, maybe a fingerprint if they were lucky mm. and so they were pushing this out so we didn't take as much care in those days my experience of policing starts in the very late 70s 79 80 so it's closer to then mm. than it is to now yeah. uh, we didn't take a huge amount of care like they do now before putting descriptions and cctv stills out now they need to be pretty sure because they don't want to distract the investigation because they know something better will be coming. But in those days, we didn't know anything better was becoming, and it rarely did. Yeah. So we tended to push out everything in the hope that we got something. Right. Often we didn't, usually we didn't, but sometimes we did. OK, so the police were working as best they could under incredible pressure, with no leads and limited tools. With concerns the trophy would never be recovered, the FA and the police made a crucial decision. They went to Fenchurch Street to visit silversmith George Bird. It's within the square mile of the City of London, a short walk north from Tower Bridge. Now it's home to office workers in concrete and glass high-rise buildings. But in 1966, the street still housed little workshops like George's. Uh, Mr Bird, I'm Joe Mears from the FA and these gentlemen are from the Metropolitan Police. We have a very sensitive matter we need to discuss with you. Sir, what we are about to George Bird was a respected metal worker. He had a long-running relationship with the FA, making cups and replicas for them. They came to him on the Sunday night and said, I want you to make a replica, but it, you can't distinguish it from the real thing. It can't be distinguished apart from detailed technical examination, was the wording, because he, he kept records of all this. And basically he was told, you don't tell anybody about this. That's Which again, surprised. yeah. Don't, don't tell anybody. Nobody knows about this. You need to have a small group of people working on this and they have to work at night. So it's all his, his, his best silversmiths are going to work on this, but they're only going to work on it at night after everybody else has gone home. They've got loads and loads of photographs of it that they have to take for uh, insurance reasons and what have you. So they knew all the technical specifications of it, how to make it, but they were just to make one out of base metal originally. And they went to FIFA, we're going to make a, a replica. No, you're not. It's our, it's our copyright. You can't make it. So on the Sunday, we're talking hours now, and hours after this cup has been stolen, uh, the Flying Squad detectives are there with the FA representative. Very senior officials from both organisations are immediately asking Mr Bird to uh, make a replica and keep it secret. So they're conspiring together to do something which is potentially illegal, is that correct? Uh, allegedly, I think we'll chuck in there, <laughs> although they're all long gone now. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the only logical conclusion to all this. Let's clarify that. FIFA is the governing body for world football. They own the copyright on the trophy and they refused the FA's request to make a replica. But that didn't stop the FA and the police from ploughing on with their secret plot. When he was asked to make a copy, Bird was already very familiar with it. The real trophy had actually been in the country since the World Cup draw that January. You're listening to Stealing Victory. I'll be back after a short break. This is Stealing Victory. In the run-up to the tournament, the trophy was regularly taken out to events. It was a crowd puller, which is why it had been on display at the Stanley Gibbon Stamp Exhibition in March. But if you think the security at the Stamp Exhibition was lax, then brace yourself for how it had been handled over the preceding couple of months. George Bird, the jeweller, he had it in his possession because the FA didn't have a big enough safe. So it is in the strong room of his company in Fenchurch Street in the middle of London. Anybody wanted some event and they wanted a bit of publicity, they'd get in touch with the FA and say, can we have the Jules Rimet trophy? Oh, yeah, fine. They probably charged them. I mean, there's nothing to say whether they did or not. I remember seeing it on Blue Peter, for example, as a, well, a nine-year-old boy. I remember seeing it on Blue Peter. They have the trophy. And they're handling it and passing it around. If it was being used in an event in the evening, George Bird took it home with him and then rode from his home in Barnet in North London to wherever it was needed in London on his bike. And it was in the basket on the front of his bike with a tea towel over it. 
So this is secure. <laughs> <laughs> so then it would just be left in his house. Yeah, his house. Yeah. Under his bed or wherever, mm -hmm. until he takes it back to the strong room. Yeah, that's, this is what's going on, yeah. And then when it's supposed to be secure, it gets stolen. What does this tell us about uh, how the FA were treating the security side of the cup if they're letting a bloke cycle around London with it on, in, the, in the basket of his bicycle? Shall we be kind and say amateurish? <laughs> it's just, it's, there's all sorts of things about this, though. These people are not of the real world. So let's look at this. Scotland Yard had issued the description of a suspect who didn't exist. Meanwhile, within hours of the theft, they were colluding with the FA in secret to have a replica made in case they never found the original. These were the actions of powerful men in a state of panic. Not only were the UK and international media all over the story, but the authorities had become a laughing stock. And now, Kenneth Horne, master spy. I had to move fast. I called Sir Andrew Sweet, head of the FA, at his headquarters. Hello, Sweet FA here. <laughs> I felt that he knew something. I had to get into FA headquarters somehow, but how? I hurried to the disguise department of the MI5 boutique. Hello, anyone there? Oh, hello, I'm Julian. This is my friend Sandy. <laughs> the embarrassment went all the way to the top. Labour Prime Minister Harold Wilson was a wily politician who portrayed himself as the working man's man. Football was the working man's sport. He had called a snap election in an effort to increase his tiny majority in Parliament, and 11 days before polling day, the World Cup had vanished. Peter Weston was a rookie PC in 1966. We'll hear in later episodes how he played a central role in the fate of both the replica and the real World Cup. He knew one of Wilson's security team, who told him how the government had responded to the debacle. Harold Wilson was absolutely furious. The government, the cabinet were furious, the embarrassment that the country had suffered this thing being stolen, and pressure was put on making a duplicate. So, yeah, there was political, and that's one of the reasons why pressure was brought by the government to have a duplicate made. They, they just forced it through, get it done, get it sorted, don't care what you do, but we don't want it stolen again which was fair comment. <laughs> and when you think whole world of football and then suddenly the cup's been stolen, no way they could suppress the story. So it was worldwide. Everybody knew. So, yeah, they thought, well, this is massive embarrassment. You know, first time we've had it. We've, we've lost it before we won it. <laughs> Realising how sport could help him politically, Harold Wilson had formed the first ever Ministry of Sport in 1964. And the impact the cup theft had on his government is reflected in the memoirs of the man that he made Minister for Sport, Dennis Howell. He recalled the horror on the face of the FA secretary as he broke the news of the theft. Dennis Howells wrote, There was consternation everywhere, and the government had good reason to be worried. On the election campaign trail, the opposition leader, Edward Heath, was laying into the state of the nation's finances, and he even brought the theft of the cup into his speech. The real reserves are down to 88 million. That's the result of 17 months of socialist government. And then I saw the World Cup had disappeared. <laughs> and I said to myself, can they even have got it there? Sport has always had the power to unite nations and capture the public's imagination. Black US sprinter Jesse Owens humiliated Adolf Hitler at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin by winning four gold medals. More recently, ANC leader Nelson Mandela wore the Springbok shirt at the Rugby World Cup finals in 1995. The jersey was one of the most hated symbols of the South African apartheid regime. Mandela used the international sporting occasion to make a powerful statement about forgiveness and unity. Like Mandela after him, Howard Wilson knew the importance of images and symbolism in politics. I'm embarrassed to admit I was old enough to be around at that time and got the grey hair to prove it, although I don't remember it. But I grew up on the story. A man who knows a thing or two about British politics and football is my Daily Mirror colleague, associate editor Kevin Maguire. He's a veteran political pundit and a Sunderland fan. 
So just 11 days before the nation was due to go to the polls, what would the theft have meant to Harold Wilson? Wilson wanted to win that election, and he did, on a wave of optimism and change. A new Britain being born, you'd had the drab 50s, you'd come into the 60s. He liked to court the Beatles, hang around with him, wanted to be a man of the people, HP source. But he wanted that optimism. That's what he wanted. And the World Cup getting nicked like that, it, we would have thought, oh, no, damn, uh, it's probably something more serious than that. Because he would know it looks like the country isn't functioning properly because he's trying to get Britain a new place in the world. Mm-hmm. We're going through this period, you win the war, then you have decolonisation, you're losing your empire, huge economic problems, uh, things aren't going as well as, as you want. 64, you've ended 13 years of Tory rule, he comes in, he's talking about the white heated technology, moving on, and then something quite as simple that turns into a laughing stock around the world. You have the World Cup, you're hosting the tournament, and you lose it? It gets stolen? It's sort of, it's almost impossible when you look back to think this actually happened, but it did, so he, he would have known there was a potential damage there because it just didn't look as if the country was going as smoothly and successfully as he would have wanted to present. So with all that political pressure, what would that have meant for the detectives charged with finding the cup? How much heat would the investigating officers have been feeling from above? Ex-Flying Squad detective Peter Kirkham again. Yes, the Home Secretary, the Home Office, the, the Commissioner, everybody would be jumping up and down saying, do something, get, get this done, get it back. The, the subtext of that, sometimes said in so many words, was I don't care how you do it, just do it. I mean, nowadays the politicians, to a certain extent, and the, and the senior police officers certainly are aware that if you put too much pressure on operational officers to get a result by this afternoon, you are actually encouraging um, improper actions. So they sort of tend to mitigate it a bit now, and it's not quite so blatant. They don't quite put so much pressure on, but even now... Um, in those days, it would have been absolutely blatantly obvious that pressure was there to get it done. Lincoln's Inn is a cluster of ornate 17th century brick buildings surrounded by manicured lawns. It's one of London's four inns of court, the professional associations for barristers. I went there to visit the chambers of QC and author Thomas Grant. His most recent book is Court Number no. One, The Old Bailey, the trials and scandals that shocked modern Britain. Nowadays, the idea of the government influencing police investigations or prosecuting decisions is anathema and pretty much unthinkable. In the 60s, not so much. Undoubtedly, the relationship between politicians and the police and decision-making in terms of who to investigate, who to charge and what to charge them with was much closer than it is now. And one of the reforms that took place in the sense of the creation of the Crown Prosecution Service was designed to create transparency in prosecuting decisions and to create an a entirely separate body making decisions as to who to charge and for what offences. There was a, a much closer and much more unhealthy relationship in those days between politicians and the police. With the FA and police under intense pressure, what did they have to go on? Dear sir, if, as mentioned in the Berliner Zeitung, the best they had were a load of crackpot theories sent from home and abroad. ...make the visit only under the eyes of the watchman. The undersigned therefore proposes that the guard personnel be exhaustively interrogated and, at the same time, that their dwellings be thoroughly searched. Yes, sir. I should also like to help you on your search for the World Cup and would suggest that you look for a coloured man, tall who is wearing a white mac and may be on your list of suspects. On the 20th of March, 1966, at 1pm, I was on the tube when I noticed two men aged about 25 years sitting about 15 yards away from me. In front of them on the floor was a brown holdall and I could see some kind of trophy sticking out of the top. Daily newspaper reports about the theft. I can't help myself but to have a quiet chuckle. In Germany we say, a blind hen will also find food. I should like to be the hen and get the other half of the reward. I would like to end with an English saying, please keep smiling and give me a chance. And then, as detectives waded through a maze of dead ends, a breakthrough. Detective Inspector Buggy. 
Buggy, it's Joe Mears from the FA. I have a demand for £15,000. Who from? He calls himself Jackson. Read it to me. OK. It says, Dear Joe... No, no doubt, doubt you view you we very much concern the loss of the World Cup. To me, it's only so much scrap gold. So, if you want to see it again, I suggest you do as I say and follow my instructions. First, if the press or the police are informed of this, the cup will go into the melting pot. Admittedly, I will only get a fraction of the money I want, but I shall be safe and you lose the cup forever. But if you're willing to pay me £15,000 in five and one pound notes, you shall have your cup back and you'll be satisfied and so will the rest of the world. If you agree with this, follow these instructions. Insert in Thursday's evening news personal column, Willing to do business. Signed, Joe. I stress once again that this cup is only so much scrap to me and repeat, do not inform press or police. It would be a great pity to destroy this cup in view of its great history and the beauty it portrays. If I do not hear from you by Thursday or Friday at the latest, I assume it's one for the pub. Scotland Yard had been struggling for leads and now they had something concrete to go on. This was the real deal. Inside the package with the ransom note was part of the lid of the trophy. Coming up in episode three. So this is what's going to happen. No tricks now or it's off. Oi, come back! Stealing Victory is an original Audi production. If you've enjoyed listening, then please do like us on your podcast app. Leave a review and subscribe. Our hashtag is Stealing Victory, all one word. More information can be found at audi.co forward slash Stealing Victory. Stealing Victory is written and hosted by me, Tom Pettifor, with thanks to everyone at the Daily Mirror for their support during the investigation. Sound design is by Norman Goodman. Theme music by Nick Reynolds and Edward Rose. Title music by Guy Farley. Executive editor is Owen Bennett-Jones, editor-in-chief Andrew Sampson, and series producer is Zach Brophy.